Assalamu alaikum guys, uh, Qasim, Hasnain, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Qasim, you know, I've been trying to, we've been trying to get in this podcast for quite some time. Uh, you know, your work is absolutely phenomenal. And <laughs> so, so happy that you said yes to us, you know, being someone who works with Nike and, Adi, uh, and Instagram and, and Facebook. <laughs> For you to come and and join us a very small podcast is it's really 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 uh, you know really, really wonderful. So thanks You're so much. You're most welcome. You're most welcome. <laughs> really You're appreciate it. Busier than I am, but <laughs> so uh, I think I mentioned that you know um, my day job is working with the Muslim Vibe, and that's really where I first came across your work. Mm-hmm. Uh, our creative director Hasib uh, shares some of your designs uh on uh, on instagram and yeah. every single one is absolutely amazing and stellar yeah. um, but before we get into uh uh you know like the kind of you know your story um i need to ask you about that piece that you did uh the michael jordan logo with the calligraphy inside it because uh, the first time i saw that i was watching the last dance and you i think you mentioned in your caption that you're watching it as well yeah the michael jordan documentary when i first saw that logo I had to, all your work is fantastic, but I had to take a. There it is. Has name's got a, hey. uh, for those for those in that haven't seen it. Here you go. I, I don't know how you do the makeup stuff. With the girls on YouTube, but do it. But here you go. I had to do a double take, and I'll be honest yeah. with you. Every few days, I'll I'll stalk your Instagram and just check it out again because that's how much it, it spoke to me. And I think oh, nice. the reason it spoke to me so much was because it kind of collated um, spirituality and Dean and Islam with something so inspirational in itself. So, you know, the Last Dance documentary, as we know, um, you know, it's about Michael Jordan, who, who, who's, yep. uh, uh, you know, a figure that is quite polarizing. It's about basketball, which is essentially just a sport. But on yeah. a deeper level, it's about grind. It's about working hard. It's about, you know, look, aiming for the best in what you do. Um, and I think that in itself is a very a deeply Islamic principle. Um, you know, something that the, uh, the Holy Prophet taught us, which is, you know, he wants Muslims to be the absolute best that they can be in every field, right? Uh, and so seeing that logo brought out those emotions in me and just and, and made me think you need to, and told me, Nuri, when you go to work, <laughs> aspire to be the best, you know, uh, <laughs> when you do anything you do, uh, you know, make sure you do it 100%. So, you know, I just wanted to ask you, about that logo, what kind of, what was your design process in making that specifically? What inspired you to do it? And what actually is written uh, inside it? Because I couldn't make out the actual Arabic uh, calligraphy that you put inside. Yeah, so uh, the calligraphy reads Air Jordan in Arabic, kind of just made in a pattern, just filling up the whole space. And you know, I was just watching The Last Dance and just basically anything I see, if it inspires me to make something, I'll just make it and drop it. So. My Instagram feed in that sense is like a journal. It's like whatever is happening at that moment and I want to highlight it, I want to share it. And that's why the caption is like part of the story, right? It's like, yeah, mm. I've been watching this documentary as have, I don't know how many other people around the globe. And, you know, his hustle inspires me to the extent and I view everything through the lens of Arabic calligraphy. That's my mm. passion. So mm. I try to bring those two things together and knowing because I've been doing it for such a such a long time, knowing that there are other people that would find themselves in a particular piece. Now, I'm not the biggest basketball fan at all, but yeah. growing up in the '90s, um, and that's where I mean, that's where mo- majority of the documentary is about. Is um, it brings back so many memories, mm. right? Um, and I'm just trying to capture just my own nostalgia mixed with like the spotlight that's on Michael Jordan, even the fact that. It's like a 10 episode documentary uh, spread over uh, five weeks or so. Yeah. That yeah. whole idea was kind of new for me as well. Like, yo, yeah. I can't even binge watch this. I have to do like <laughs> two episodes at a, at a time. Yeah. And I can't really wait for the next two episodes to be released. So the process is that I just watch, it, it just inspires me. And I've had the, uh, the idea of like uh, grabbing the Air Jordan logo and doing something with it for quite some time. I just felt like, okay, this is the time. Yeah, I think I think I, yeah. I, I, sorry to interrupt. I got that sense when I read your caption. Uh, I forgot exactly what you wrote, but it felt to me like you've had the idea for so long and you just wanted to get it out. And now is the perfect time to finally uh, design it and release it. Most definitely. So you know, I think every artist, creative in, in any field, has like such a long to do list of things to do, and then sometimes it just starts making sense. Like okay, now, it's, now it's the time to actually work on this, and it yeah. just gives you that extra bit of inspiration because it's so relevant at that at that point in time so i was like okay it's 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 almost like a now or never kind of thing unless yeah. jordan has another huge whatever <laughs> yeah. uh that, that that's that's big um 
so yeah, it's it's just one of those, and every story is kind of like that. So mm. uh, it's just a reflection. It's either something I've seen, I've heard, um, and I know people are dealing with. And and to be honest, if I have the time, I work on it. Sometimes, like you know, you're working on like client work, yeah, and then you just miss out. But when when the time is there, and I'm like overly inspired, I, I try to sh- make sure I make the time to work on a piece mm. like that. Yeah. No, absolutely so. wonderful, and I think um, you know. We will get into later uh, uh, about the the the, the different the, the, the kind of different difference between working for a client and working on a project because like you know you're inspired to do so. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Hasnain, even you can relate to that. You know, as a filmmaker, sometimes you're hired to do a job, and sometimes yeah. you put your own money into a short film. Um, I'm definitely you know in that part as well. Sometimes, for example, not in terms of payments, but sometimes I'm asked to, for example, write a poem for someone. Sometimes I just write it because I feel it. So I think we need to like delve into that creative aspect as well. But Qasim, when it comes to calligraphy specifically and typography, I think it's very unique from other forms of, of visual art. Um, it has its you know completely. I feel like it has its, it's it's in its own world you know i don't think you know anyone who's an artist can be a, a calligrapher i think you have to have to, be, have to have a very certain perspective on things uh, to be a calligrapher but for like people who don't understand what it takes uh, to kind of like delve into calligraphy um can you explain to us like what kind of mindset you need going into it the reason i say that is because i feel like as muslims we grow up seeing calligraphy all around us. You know, you go to the local mosque, there's calligraphy everywhere. You know, you travel yeah. to Turkey yeah. or, you know, uh, back to the Middle East, you see calligraphy, calligraphy everywhere and you really almost take it, for, uh, uh, you know, you take, you take it for granted. Um, the fact that, you know, someone spent so much time uh, doing this calligraphy and it's more than just, you know, scattering words on a wall. There's a very specific artistic element to it, a very specific, almost a mathematical element to it. Um, so what kind of mindset do you need to have going into uh, calligraphy and typography? Uh, that's a difficult question. Uh, I guess for myself, I was always intrigued, like, you know, being Pakistani, being a yeah. non-Arab Muslim, reading the Quran is, I was, as a young kid, I was amazed that these, I guess, squiggly lines have meaning and have a beautiful sound, right? Um, as you grow up, uh, you start delving more into the scriptures and understanding, translation, etc. And um, for me specifically, I, I was like doing a line of work that I wasn't really happy with. And I was trying to stay within the creative field and trying to find something else. And I was like, you know what? I actually really enjoy looking at Arabic calligraphy, Arabic typography. So I got into it as, as something that's always been there, right? So I can't really say like what the exact mindset is. If you mm. have an appreciation for uh, neat handwriting, right? If, if you put it very bluntly, um, but when you start looking at people, when they start writing, you start understanding what it takes to actually, well, he actually, maybe he wrote like a single sentence. So then you realize the preparation that went into that, right? Mm. It's, it's, it's posture. It's having the right papers, having the right pen. It's having the right ink, mm. right? And then you've not even done anything. It's just a certain preparation that you do. You start sketching, start drafting. So, you know, and, what you see there's there's a whole process behind it so i got really intrigued by the level of dedication that you require and when i start i mean this is you now we had internet at home i started reading and looking at people's work and seeing mm. how they were making it i thought it was just amazing something that's so simple quote unquote mm. like mm. it's like you said you take it for granted mm. and you start realizing the amount of work that goes into it mm. and i was the kind of t- kind of uh, kind of guy to when i saw it i was like yo i want to try that as well and of course, you know, you feel miserable and you're like, okay, this is much harder than it looks. But, you know, when you have a passion for it, you kind of just don't realize how many hours you've spent and you just yeah. keep going, keep going. Yeah. And then, you know, yeah. that comes a point where you're like, okay, now I've got something here that I can build upon. Um, and that actually made me appreciate just text and scripture yeah. in general, really, right? So if I pick up a Quran, I understand that someone wrote this right mm. of course it's reproduced and reprinted but someone wrote it in a way that it's balanced right because in calligraphy you can very easily have a part of the calligraphy look very busy just because of the combination of letters and another part that looks that's really empty and really uh, minimal right but the, the fact that someone wrote it for us it becomes so readable when it's quite easy to make it more difficult because you know there's so many variations of letter and just knowing that someone did this and um, 
with that, when I realized that one of the teachers I had early on, he basically said, is that you should learn calligraphy for the sake of being able to write the Quran by hand. Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, that's the kind I was like, yo, that's really not the reason I'm going to calligraphy. Yeah. Uh, that's a huge responsibility. But he made me realize <laughs> the work that goes into like, you know, this book that we all have at home, you pick it up, you read it. Mm. And when you start realizing that someone wrote this and you know, took their time and I don't know, double, yeah. triple, quadruple checked everything to make sure it's right, it's easy on the eye. And then you realize I've got friends that are like Hafiz al Quran. They're like, you know, when I recite, I can see the pages in front of me. Wow. That's I also link to the fact that someone wrote it in a way that's easy to digest and remember mm. and, and copy. So all these elements um, just inspired me to, do, to pick that up as I was trying to get away from, you now I was doing a lot of graphic design for like, um, just like club promoters and music festivals. So, so you, I, you were always in graphic design. It wasn't like you were in like a desk job and then you moved to, to calligraphy. No, I started quite young. So I was okay. about like I guess 14, 15 when I started making like, you know, wallpapers and all, you know, you had like Fort, like, I don't know, like a Dragon Ball Z forum and people had like these cool signatures and wallpapers. Mm. I was like, and they were sharing tutorials, right? They were sh- telling you like, this is how you do it. And this is the days of like Photoshop 6.0, right? Like oh, way, yeah. way back. So when, when I, was, when, when I'm reading these tutorials and I actually end up with something that looks, that looks cool at the time, and I kept going and trying new settings and all that stuff. So by the time I was 17, I've probably been practicing every day. Well, just every day after yeah. school, you just start messing about and trying new things. Um, and then, you know, start doing flyers and whatnot. And um, that's how I started from graphic design and then how I transitioned into uh, showcasing calligraphy. Mm. And when people saw that, they're like, okay, can you mix it with, this business I have, I need a, you oh. know, I have this, I don't know, like an iftar event, I have such and such. And that's, I was, I was like, oh, I actually never realized that that could actually come together as well. Yeah. We, 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 we'll, we'll definitely, um, you know, I think that whole topic of bringing, um, and, and even like when it comes to, for example, the title of this podcast, I wanted to name it Islamic Calligraphy in the Western World, because that's almost what you do, you know, you bring something, some uh, an art that's very uh, Eastern, very, uh, you know, um, rooted in, uh, a religion that was born in the East, but you you, you really mash it with uh, modern day culture. Uh, and, you know, you speak a lot about it, uh, that on your website as well, which I do want to get into. But before I do, yeah. as name, I wanted to ask you, um, I just kind of like this kind of came to me just hearing Asim speak. Um, ask me whatever you want. I have a lot of thoughts in my head right now. <laughs> I, got of, I got a lot of thoughts in my head. I'll, I'll feel free to jump in, you know, <laughs> whenever you have a thought, just blurt out. Um, but, but when it comes to, um, you know, artistic expression, I feel like every people's, has their way of artistic expression. So, yep. for example, you know, for 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 Muslims, um, you know, cal- uh, uh, Arabic calligraphy and and, and Islamic calligraphy, or, uh, Quranic calligraphy, is something so deeply entrenched in not just uh, the culture of Arabs or the culture of uh, Pakistanis, but the culture of Muslims. You know, I feel like yep. that's one unifying fact, one unifying uh, culture that all Muslims kind of adhere to, which is beautiful. Um, and you know, I was just thinking about how different peoples have their own forms of expression. So I remember walking through Queens, New York, you know, uh, where, where you grew up and just seeing, uh, you know, murals all over the place, you know, beautiful artistic yeah. murals, um, uh, you know, with, ty- you know, with using, using words and using fonts almost in their own kind of way of calligraphy. Uh, if that, yeah. that kind of makes sense. So like, wh- how, what do you think uh, artistic expression uh, says about people's growing I up think, in the environment uh, that you did? So, like, for me, like, you know, if you walk around Queens, you're going to see anything from really old school graffiti, uh, you know, uh, just on the wall, which is very artistic, to, like, actual murals. If you walk down, you know, Soho, and you see all these murals on the thing. So, I think what the artistic expression of these murals are are, are the times that we're living in, right? Because a lot of the time, these murals are coming on based on where we are today. You know, people have a lot to say. People have a lot to express especially in the world we live in today. Um, you know, a lot of the old school, you know, graffiti that's, you know, also calligraphized as well. It also talks about the time that they lived in, you know, back in the day, you know, what is Long Island City today, which is the highest sky rises, used to be where a lot of these graffiti artists used to go and, and collectively sit together and just express their thoughts and their art, you know? Mm. And so I want to also go back to one thing 
that Gossip mentioned about how, um, you know, when you look at uh, calligraphy and not just calligraphy, let's just talk about random art, just art in general, because um, as somebody who loves to go to museums and look at, you know, these paintings and stuff like that, you know, you look at it and you can appreciate it, but you never know how difficult it was behind the scenes to create that. Mm. Now, um, I'm going to go there and I'm going to say, as somebody who has uh, Arabic calligraphy tattoos, um, mm. and so like, you know, I hire a calligrapher to make, you know, the, what I want and then I go to my tattoo artist and do it. So the time and the process and the way that the artist has to basically go with the client and, we can, and we're going to discuss this future on, uh, later on, um, I, I respect that, and, and I never really appreciated what goes behind um, the artistic vision hmm. until I had to do it when it came to my films. I'm like, oh my god, like this is the whole process of everything. And then that's where I realized, you know, expressionism and, and all the stuff that goes into the art means a lot because we can sit here and we can draw and we can create any film that we want because somebody paid us to do it or because we're just doing it for the sake of doing it. Hmm. But the meaning behind the process of getting it done that's the you know that's the expression that's the meaning behind the artwork yeah so I, so for me it's just like it, it's i didn't realize that till i had to do it until my own two feet had to go in that route yeah. i'm like all right yeah, yeah that's i think good. you know I, when it comes to arabic calligraphy specifically there's there's still a lot more that i need to learn but like looking at custom yeah. custom looking at your work you know it just inspires me to like delve into it and kind of understand the process more um i remember when i first started working at the muslim vibe i'm not a very uh, I'm not very attuned when it comes to uh, uh, graphic design and, and, and visual arts per se. I'm more like, you know, my role there is video producer. So I'm working on the videos there um, and, you know, uh, filming and editing and stuff like that. But when it comes to graphic design and things that involve, you know, um, uh, essentially, you know, visual art, uh, <laughs> me and Hasib, who's the creative director, do get into it sometimes because I, I sometimes don't have the mindset for it. Um, and it's only until working with him that I realized that, you know, for example, there's a reason we use this font, for example, and not that font. There's a reason that this font works with this design and not that design. So I think until you get into the intrinsics of it, you realize how much effort goes in uh, to these very minute details. You know, he always goes on about the font that Nike uses, for example, and the reason they use this font. Um, so... That being said, uh, Qasim, I did want to ask you, uh, you know, when it comes to your name, Ilmco, you talk about this on your website, um, the name Ilmco uh, combines two things that you love, Ilm being knowledge in Arabic, uh, and the phrase Il cool, which is like from hip hop, right? Um, yeah. so talk about how these two things are kind of like your mantras that inspire your work, given that it's, it's uh, something very traditionally Islamic, uh, I would say, uh, but at the same time, really cool and edgy and modern. So like, what made you want to combine these two things into your work? Because I feel like I haven't really seen, maybe it's just, it's just me, but I haven't really seen artists uh, who really delve down that, that route, who, who, who bring something, um, you know, so uh, historic and meld it so well with modern culture, modern pop culture. So like, what made you want to explore that avenue? Um, I think it took me some time to actually get to that part where I was able to articulate what my own voice and vision was. Um, but the first time I actually mixed it, like mixed, say, modern culture with calligraphy was when, and this is some time back, uh, Floyd Mayweather mm. was having his 49th match, which he won. And But leading up to that match, I was actually just watching his documentaries and just trying to understand who this guy is because he was super flamboyant. But I was like, there's a reason he actually made it to that point of being 48 mm. and 0. And that just like hell inspiring. I was like, of course, that's just that's the side which is which I, I guess it's the showman's side, but then there's mm. the fighter and the athlete and the discipline that goes in there. So that so I was like, yo, this is super inspiring. I I feel like I should do something with this. So I just um, I just dropped it online, and I real uh, actually the reaction of people is like, I mean, there were people that said, hey, why would you? Mm even do this because this guy, you know, he's so flamboyant, so materialistic and such and such. I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely not talking about that part of this guy because I also took a very specific picture of him being younger. I think in his teenage years, I realized like, yo, this guy still has the same mindset as he was when he was young, like that hunger and that discipline to get him where he was. And I was like, oh, that's actually, I'm, I'm pretty sure there are other people. And then 
Muhammad Ali, Malcolm X, etc. came. And mm. for me, it was like, you know, I'm, I'm finding, I'm taking something that's traditional and mixing with something new and being a hip hop head, coming up with hip hop, that was, I mean, they took samples, instruments, and just, they just flipped it to make it something new. So I felt like, you know, I'm, it's, it's a traditional art with like a hip hop attitude. It's like yeah. making it one way or the other and just making it your own. And also when, I'm, I'm not a traditional calligrapher. Like I can use the digital tools to create a classical piece. I would not be able to create that by hand right in mm. front of you, right? Because I realized that I love the tradition and that's my foundation. I've studied it, I've analyzed it, but I've not taken that to create something on my own. Um, and I saw how Arabic calligraphy actually had developed itself, right? It, it, I mean, back in the days they just wrote i mean they didn't even write right there were only specific there were very mm. few people that were able to write mm. and as islam expanded right and, and went into other territories they started writing and then it, the, the scripture expanded with like adding dots that, that was a new thing at some point then you know the the vowels uh you know the zeas of pesh as we say mm. uh those were added <laughs> <laughs> and then you see well this what I'm reading in the Quran, it wasn't there from the start. It it developed, right? Yeah. And then you see that it developed differently based on the region. The way mm. it developed in Baghdad is dif- different than developed in Istanbul or in mm. Turkey, yeah. and the way it developed in Morocco. And then I realized, okay, well, actually, you know, why did it, why did the development stop, right? Hmm. I'm taking this because I know at the start you get a lot of criticism like well this is not traditional calligraphy I was like well you know, people developed it and I'm just taking it and I'm developing with the the influences that that I have here so for me now it's like you know it has to continue right someone decided like you know what we need to have a mathematical structure to this calligraphy right we, we're going to use these dots to measure the correctness of each letter and the combination mm. of those. So I was like, let me take this and, and just use whatever influences I have. And for a long time, I've just kind of hidden the, I guess, the, the influence of hip hop. And it's just, it's not just music, right? It's, it's music. It's, it's uh, break dancing. It's mm. graffiti art, right? Yeah. Uh, I've been studying, studying is a big word, but I've been looking at graffiti art as, as, as long as I can remember. And though I've never like done it myself in the sense like just, taking someone's wall and writing on it because of like, like Islamic <laughs> ethos with that. <laughs> but I would appreciate the hustle, right? And realizing yeah, yeah. that where did graffiti start, right? It's like in these neighborhoods where, you know, the resources were taken away for this creative expression and they just used what they could, right? If it's in yeah. music, it's, it's the turntable. They used spray cans were not meant for <laughs> creating art like they did, but they just took the tools and just created something of their own. And when I realized that, oh, that's what I've been doing, I was like, okay, let me just verbalize this in in something. Okay, let me find a different name because I've been working under, so, I, so my graphic design work was done under static designs. Mm. So a lot of people that knew me back then, they were like, oh, that's static, mm. that's static designs, that's Casa AK static. And I was like, no, I feel like this, I'm not creating artwork that deserves its own podium and it has to tell a story. Mm, um, yeah. So I was like, okay, let me just tell them what it is. Um, there's no guesswork. I was like, these are my influences. This is why this is my name. And, you know, this is where like all my work stems from, from this name. And for me, it's also a reminder that um, whatever I create, it has to share some information. Right? It, it, uh, it has to tell a story some way, mm. somehow. I know whether it yeah. enlightens you or it reminds you something that you might have forgotten. And I guess first and foremost, it reminds myself. Whenever I'm creating it, it reminds myself of why I'm making this and you know what it does to me. Uh, especially today, you know, there's so much distraction and you, you forget things. So even like, you know, every once in a while, someone shares a work of mine that I've made, I don't know, maybe two, three weeks ago, maybe two, three years ago. And I realized I remember why I made that. And like you said, with the Jordan piece, it probably did something else for you mm. than it did for me. Mm. And yeah. Probably much more for someone that's actually followed Jordan's career in those years, right? Mm. Like mm. for me, I'll be honest, like I, like you no know one Space Jam came out mm. in the 90s. Yeah. That was what really got me into basketball. Mm. After that, I started following um, basketball like 
as much as I could. But in, in Holland, there wasn't much basketball on, on television. So, so let me ask you this. Who's your favorite basketball team? <laughs> I don't, guys, I don't, guys, I don't guys. Have a, I don't have please, a favorite one. But guys, I'll tell you please this. keep it civil. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll tell you this. Um, for some reason, I had a very soft spot for Scottie Pippen. For the simple right. fact that I knew that he was crucial but he didn't get the same love i guess and that's probably got to do with me being the youngest of three brothers at home and like you know yeah, you were always players too right everybody wants to be jordan i was like well jordan needs a scotty pippen right hmm. that's He's, true that's true so it was one of those things and it wasn't really based on me like following it that much but yeah. the bit that i did get I was like, man, I think he's just an essential. And I kind of like yeah. the fact that he's not as big as Jordan. It, it mm, kind of yeah. adds to the story as well. Uh, mm. I was however, hoping you said you're a Knicks fan, but it didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> I you know, know. Like, it's all right, like, though. Grow, growing up in Europe, right, like we're more about football, let's say, mm. aka soccer yeah. uh, mm. for you guys. But um, <laughs> so uh, basketball, but like, you know, through hip hop, like there's so many, so many so yeah. many references to basketball as a sport right so you still get so much from that yeah uh, so i hope like football gets at that level uh, it yeah. happens like in like dutch and uh, i think uh british rap there's more references yeah. to soccer it's than- it's insane how hip-hop has such a global impact on a lot of things um and i just wanted to say that before when you first started just like when you mentioned how hip-hop has a lot to do with your work and just coming off of the episode, we were talking about sneakers and how hip hop has a lot to do with sneakers. Um, and and even before that, we were talking about you know um, African Americans and, and African American Muslims and how hip hop is so involved in that as well. <clears throat> it's just insane how you know it, it travels worldwide. You know, um, and I, I just wanted I just wanted to mention that. Um, go ahead. That's a very good point. I actually did want to ask you, Kasim, about it because. Um, you know, we spoke about this has name, uh, I believe, in episode three, and we will have a proper se- episode about this as well. Um, but Islam has such a very interesting relationship uh, with music. And Qasim, yeah. I don't want to get into like your own personal beliefs, but I think it goes without saying that different Muslims have different uh, understandings of what they believe uh, 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 constitutes uh, halal when it comes to music, etc. So what I did want to ask you is that, you know, as someone who is very kind of um, you know, hip hop is very evident. Hip hop culture is very evident in your in your in your art, um, and you know, even like uh, kind of like the people that you promote uh, in your artwork is kind of like evident of that. So, what I wanted to ask you is, do you get any backlash? You know, uh, being so kind of embracing that uh, uh, identity of you uh, being someone who is a Muslim, a practicing Muslim, and someone who also loves hip hop. Like, do you get any backlash for that? Whether it be local backlash. Uh, or people online, uh, and if so, how do you kind of deal with that? Um, not too much. I mean, I remember comments here and there, but I think when people follow my work, they understand where I'm coming from. Right? Mm. So when yeah. I do drop like a, a Quranic ayah that I've interpreted in my own way and say um, on the day that Notorious B.I.G. passed away, I drop a piece that I did of him, and there was somebody said well he said such and such uh, mm. you know this is blasphemous and i was like you know what? i'm definitely not highlighting that i'm not gonna pretend yeah. that he didn't say it but i was like i was like there's elements to his life to his lyrics that you know i resonate with mm. and a lot of people usually get that they understand that i'm definitely not i mean even like tupac right is it is it dear mama or is it how do you want it right it's like yeah. it's like there's there's I think one thing I, I do appreciate about musicians is they're so they're an open book, right? They do share a lot about themselves, like all the flaws and there's so much inspiration I take from that, uh, because I wouldn't be able to do that myself, I think. Mm. But yeah. I I think that's what's so interesting about, you know, um when Muslims kinda of like discuss non-Muslims or, or, or any uh, types of non-Muslim art, there is always that, that, that kind of like uh, uh, feedback of, oh, but how can you discuss him? You know, there's, there's always an element of how can you discuss someone? Um, excuse me. There's always an element of if you're discussing someone, it almost means you're, uh, uh, you're praising them in a way that, you, you know, it, it's almost if you're accepting every single part of them, their positives and their negatives, right? So even yeah. for example, before we started this podcast, we mentioned a few times, Hasnain, uh, we, we were like, can we 
sit down and discuss film, for example, when film has a lot of sex, nudity, violence, swearing, and etc. Uh, and I think our whole perception of it was that, you know, we're not here to discuss, like you said, Qasim, those specific aspects, but we're here to discuss other positive aspects, the, the things that right. we more also relate to. Um, a lot of your artwork is based around Muslim celebrities. So, for example, I know you did that uh, uh, project for Facebook where, for example, you highlight, highlighted uh, Mesut Ozil, uh, Dean Tokyo, uh, Khabib, different kind of Muslim celebrities. To what extent do you think we should celebrate Muslim? And this kind of leads, leads on from the uh, question that we're discussing now. To what extent do you feel that we should celebrate Muslims uh, who are in the nine light? And do you feel like they should be held to account on their religiosity? So, for example, um, Dina Tokyo, for example, uh, when, she, for example, she uh, took off her hijab, a lot of people were saying, oh, you know, uh, she is representing all Muslim women. Therefore, you know, what, what she's doing is absolutely wrong. Or, for example, uh, other footballers and other celebrity, Muslim celebrities who are in the limelight, whenever they do something wrong openly, whenever they kind of like sin openly, uh, Muslims kind of say, well, you know, they're representing all Muslims. Therefore, we have to like distance ourselves from at all costs. So how do you kind of balance that uh, um, uh, and, 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 and do you think that you can Muslim celebrities should be held accountable uh, for representing all Muslims and therefore under more scrutiny? I mean, it's a difficult one, right? Like the whole notion of celebrity culture and where we put people, mm. and like just like I just said, like you know, Biggie, Tupac, they're celebrities as well. Um, I know there's like I guess I don't know the Muslim social media world uh, or just Muslims in general, right? Whoever's popular, we do praise them. I mean, we come yeah. from uh, so we're like I guess Pakistan Indian background. Mm. If you look at Bollywood, right? So yeah. many Muslim actors, right? If you look at oh stuff man, they do, Bollywood, like we that's hardly discussed, right? <laughs> it's like yeah, he's kind of praying to an idol, right? Kind yeah. of like, one of those, but he's acting, and then it's yeah, it, it's a difficult one, like. Yes, they do have the limelight. And do they have responsibility? Yes, like we do being on mm. this podcast. Right? We have a responsibility yeah. to whoever's listening at, at this moment in time. But one thing I do always uh, remind myself is like, you know, if, if like Malcolm X is one of my biggest heroes, you know, if I would have met him in his earlier stages of life, I would have a very different opinion of him mm. than you know, me being born so many years later and having seen his growth um, as he's written about it himself and, you know, through the Spike Lee movie and et cetera. Um, Great movie, again, by the way. Yeah. Again, I don't, uh, I, d I appreciate the fact that people that follow my work, they understand it right away. And of course, if you're new, it, it might look a bit weird. Like, why are you highlighting this person? Or, mm. um, so like for spe specific Dina Tokyo, that was part of the Facebook campaign and that had a specific story. So I do mm. tell people, like, do check out the story. Right. Mm -hmm. Don't judge the book by its cover and you know why see why it's done. Um for someone like Masid Ozil, I don't know his whole life. Like even Habib you would you could speak of like, you know, is it halal haram to be in UFC and doing MMA and all that kind of yeah. stuff. Uh these are valid discussions to have and you know, as long as we do it like in a civil way. Uh yeah, you know, I I do highlight the positive part and, and kinda of leave away the negative hmm. negativity. Also, because I feel like, you know, the amount of role models that we have. Yeah. I'm not saying it's, it's right or wrong, but that's just my take on it. It's like, you know, let me, let me big up this person for doing yeah. something that's good. And yeah. if they're like, I don't know, call it sinning in public and, you know, they have this limelight and we're able to judge their actions because we, that's, I mean, they're uh, acting in public, of course, we'll have an opinion about that. And, you know, mm. um, yeah. to an extent I mean, we should have, but... Um, yeah, I just try to pick up the, the, the positivity. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily like that's my motto, like, yo, everything positive. But it's like, yo, at, at certain points, like when Mesut Ozil, when he spoke up on like the Uyghur Muslims, yeah. like, yeah, I'm going to highlight that in my own way. Like the media, yeah, right. I'll do it in my own way. And just uh, just like a little shout out, a little big up uh, to Mesut Ozil. For doing yeah, that. yeah. No, I, I mean, agree. I agree with that. Yeah, I mean, uh, just to clarify, I didn't want to, I, I know a lot of my questions <laughs> have been harsh. I'm actually asking you different questions, but I, I, I just wanted to clarify to the audience that, you know, it, it's not like you're a polarizing figure. You know, I've been mm. through your Instagram, uh, you know, everyone pretty much loves your work uh, and guess what you do. Um, but I feel like these are questions sometimes that bring out the best answers in us. Um, so I hope you're not offended by me. No, it. but I'll, I'll tell you something else. Like I did a piece where it said Hussein. Yeah. Right. Um, I knew that that would be 
uh, perceived by certain people in a certain way. And mm, for me, yeah. um, I knew that was going to happen, and I understand what, where that comes from. But I was mm. like, well, when people start asking me right away, like, are you Sunni or are you Shia? Mm. Like, well, I'm Sunni Muslim, but that doesn't really mean that I'm not allowed to do this. Of mm. course, it, I know the fact that it hasn't been done so much. It doesn't yeah. get uh, highlighted as much. And mm. so when there was one specific person that was actually quite quite rude. I don't know if you know who he was, you know, like no salam, just straight like, yo, you this, you that. Mm. I was like, I don't really owe you anything. But yeah. if you check out my work, if you took out like probably five minutes of your time to see who I am, to see what I'm about, you will, you will understand where I'm coming from. And part of you know, calling myself ill is like, you know what, I am reminding myself that I should probably know, should know more about this. Hmm. should know more yeah. about the family of the Prophet I should hmm. probably know more about the whole situation of like Karbala and you know why, why, it's, why it's so important to know so and hmm. I'm just telling people you know what I actually don't know much about it I'll hmm. be honest but you hmm. know what I've read and I feel like you no, know, this deserves a piece hmm. and it was just really just simple as that but that probably gets more backlash uh, hmm. un- unfortunately uh, yeah, yeah. and as expected so the celebrity stuff is it's light work, really. Mm. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so this... Lightweight boxing compared to... <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's yeah. You know, I mean, I think that does raise an interesting question. I mean, I face this as well, for example, when it comes to uh, my poetry. You know, my audience is pretty much 99% Shia, right? So I don't have yeah. uh, the worry of, of, of offending people in that sense. Um, but at the same time, like, uh, and Hasneen, I'm sure you, you'll go through this as well. So I think each of us, through our own creative arts, might face this. So for example, Hasneen, I also use this as well. Uh, I'll ask you first and I'll, I'll jump to Qasim. Um, when you're creating something, how much do you think about the audience who's going to perceive it? So, for example, I, over the years, have had to kind of like train myself um, to when I write a poem, for example, and I'm going to throw it out there, I'm not doing it for anyone. I'm not doing it for yeah. praise. I'm not doing it for feedback. I'm doing it because I, I feel it's something I want to express. Whether it goes far or it doesn't, I don't really mind. I don't yeah. really um, and as a result, sometimes, for example, you get people, who, you know, like Qasim said, who misunderstand your work, even from within your own circle, even from within your own community. Yeah. They'll be like, how dare you say this? You know, not understanding that, for example, it's a metaphor, for example. Yeah. Um, and Hasneen, for example, I'm sure like in your field as well, you know, when you share uh, uh, films, you know, you might get backlash from, for example, the Muslim community in, in regards yeah. to something that you're showing. So how much uh, do you involve uh, thinking about who's going to see your work in your creative process. So uh, first things first, as artists, we're always misunderstood. That's <laughs> one thing I learned in being an artist. No matter who you I'll are, we're always, gonna, <laughs> we're always going to be misunderstood. Um, as a writer and a filmmaker and an actor, the question always comes up, who's your audience, who's your audience, who's your audience, especially in the film industry, because um, they want to know who you're pertaining to, who's your audience, right? Whenever I'm writing a script, uh, if I'm getting help from a, a professional uh, writer, he's going to ask me the first question, who's your audience, what you're trying to tell? For me, um, my audience, and I'll just be very blunt, is never my own people. It's never Muslim people. I'm, that's not who I'm preaching my films to. You know, um, I'm actually showing my films to the audience that's not Muslim. That's, that's kind of my audience all the time. I'm, not, I'm never worried about... Um, are, are, are like my Muslim friends and, and family going to approve this or not? It's not, it's not for them. It's, I'm not making this for them. And I think that is where um, I do get a lot of backlash for my film work, um, but I never pay no mind to it because it's just not for you. I remember one time I got a backlash um, for a film that I did um, a while back and it, it involved uh, you know a few kissing scenes in it, right? Um, and Back then, you know, I would see my film industry, my, my film take was a little bit different, um, but it, it involved like a Muslim man and a non-Muslim girl and stuff like that. Um, and I got a backlash for that. And I simply told the individual, like this, this film, what I'm trying to, what the, the message I'm trying to give here is not for you. It's for, it's for, it's for a different audience. And that's all I simply responded to him. And then that was it. Um, that's kind of how I take it. Uh, you know, that's kind of how I take it. I, I, I recently, I haven't gotten much backlash. But it's, it's it's simple as that. It's just I always think of my audience, and my audience is never is never the Muslim crowd. Hmm. Qasim, when it comes to your work, I'll ask you the same question, but I want to focus 
a lot on more so on social media. So, you know, you post a lot of your work on Instagram and I feel like what social media does, unfortunately, is that it amplifies the smallest of voices. So, you know, for example, you mentioned that that guy messaged you saying certain things, or for example, you know, you might get a uh, uh, criticism in the comments when you do other posts. Um, do you, for example, ever, is it ever in the back of your mind that, for example, I might post this picture of, let's say, for example, of Dino Tokyo. Uh, and then, you know, do you ever like in the back of your mind think, will I get uh, uh, comments that criticize this? Will I get backlash? And does that affect you in any way? Um, I mean, to an extent, I, I do hope that the, the people that see my work or follow my work, if they do feel that I'm doing something wrong, I'm actually always open to listen mm. because you know, I could definitely be wrong and mm. I do want to get better and, and, uh, and, and learn from that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I definitely, I mean, I do have an audience in mind, right? It is, it is Muslims growing up in the West, right? That's yeah. whoever my, my generation of people that will understand, uh, you know, why fashion and Arabic calligraphy, hip hop and Arabic calligraphy, sports and Arabic calligraphy actually kind of really make sense. Mm. Um, so I'm quite open to it. I'm not waiting for it. I mean, it's never fun to be corrected by anyone. And I use the word corrected because I, mm. uh, even if someone's harsh, I do try to, uh, then again, I don't get those many messages, right? So mm. if I would be flooded, right? If I was big and I get flooded, then it becomes more difficult. Then mm. you might always see the negative negativity because I do feel like whenever someone does write message me and it's something negative, I do forget about all the positive, positive. Mm. Right? So I realized like, you know what, this is one person I can I actually, I have the bandwidth to have a conversation with this person and it probably gets more difficult. The more people are looking and the more people that are reacting, it becomes difficult to have a conversation. Right? And it's just like one a single comment or, you know, people are making what about What it's about when it's, um, I'll use the, f- the phrase unfounded criticism. When I say unfounded criticism, what I mean by that is not that, you know, I think all criticism is valid, but I feel like sometimes people offer criticism when they're not as invested. People who offer criticism when they're not as invested in your work, for example, their criticism, I don't believe should be uh, put on the same level as, as, as uh, people who offer criticism that are invested. So for example, let's say I'm following you right now. I see something that you post. I'm like, hmm, I love your work, Qasim. You know, I didn't agree with this. I think maybe, for example, A, B, C, D, F, G. Then you have another person who's scrolling through Instagram who just happens to come across your account, just leaves a hateful comment and like walks away. So yeah. how do you deal with that kind of criticism? And, and, yeah, and, I, 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 I ignore you. that stuff. I hmm. ignore that stuff because you can, the way someone approaches you, you can actually see if, if they're genuine in trying to you know, wish you better, right? Wish for hmm. your brother what you wish for yourself. Like if you're, practicing that there'll be a way of approaching someone mm. and i probably take social media as in i'm talking to you one-to-one in person right mm. so like you know when someone mess like even if it's like a client request right it's like hey do you make a logo or not even hey do you make a logo it's like you know these are not edited yeah i get those sometimes too <laughs> you know have conversations with people <laughs> yeah. you know you ask you know there's a way of ta- speaking so are usually that's like a red flag right yeah it, it does, it's not even criticism i could probably make money off that yeah. conversation it's just that hey this is not, not the way i communicate with anyone so uh jenny if it's if it's negative i'll be honest man because it's not that much i usually do try to understand where they're coming from and they just kind of disregard the tone yeah but again if it's if it's like i don't know so if it's like tens or hundreds of messages then it becomes difficult to yeah. <laughs> maintain yeah. that same yeah. uh attitude uh, yeah. towards I, that i mean uh, i think you know it, i think the, the world of social media in itself is something that you know deserves its own uh, conversation like i remember i used to have a facebook profile and i converted it into a page this is years ago the reason yeah. i converted it into a page is because i would get so many messages and it's not from people who want generally want something. So for example, Hey Nuri, can I have, can you send me this poem or can I, can I give me a reference on this? Or they want something. Usually it's people who want a conversation. And unfortunately when you have dozens of people who, do, who want conversations from all over the world, it's like, well, I, I'm sorry, but I don't have that time to invest in conversations, you know, with people on, online. Yeah. Um, so I feel like that in itself uh, is a whole thing as well. And then what happens is if you respond firstly, and then you don't respond afterwards, then they, for example, they start to get offended. Um, so, you know, so uh, it, it's just very interesting how social media has kind of like, you know, like you said, it, when, you're, when you're interacting with someone on social media, it's almost as if you're not speaking to a person, you're speaking, uh, you know, 
through a picture or, or through text, which is why, for yeah. example, when I, when I message you for this podcast, I, I, I try to be, you know, as friendly as possible because I don't want to be a case of, hey, salam, Yomko. I like your I like your stuff. Please come on our podcast. That's, that's not how you communicate <laughs> with someone in real life. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. So I think it's very important. Um, I want to get into uh, expression and creative process. And inshallah, hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll use this to wind down. One of my favorite verses in the Holy Quran, uh, and this is something a sheikh mentioned to me recently, uh, was when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, We've taught man how to express himself. Um, so, you know, I think it's important to remember that in all our creative expressions, that is a gift that comes from God. You know, when we sit down to create a, a design or has name to make a film or myself to write a poem, that is a form of creative expression that God has almost taught us himself. Um, so in that sense, how do faith and spirituality inspire your creative process? Now, by that, I mean, when you sit down to write a post, uh, when you sit down, sorry, to, to, to create a design, to what extent does spirituality enter it? Do you sit down and say, oh, the Allah, Allah, Jesus, Allah, 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 I'm doing it for the sake of God, and then get into it? Or is it more a sense of, you know, for example, you have that kind of spiritual, that spirituality as a companion through your process? To what extent does it affect your work? I guess, you know, it starts with the name, right? I, I remind myself of why I've named my, myself to be Ilm, and I feel like every piece I make, it adds to a larger story, right? So, a, a Khabib Nurmagomedov or a Mesut Ozil or even a Dina Tokyo, they're not, you know, they're just pieces of a, of a larger puzzle. Mm. And um, for me, it's because, because the line of work I'm in right now and I've moved away, say, from like the club flyers and everything, like at the start, I needed a reminder much more than I need now. Like now, like all my work is pretty much based around that the, the people that approach me they understand the lens that I work from. So Alhamdulillah, I know I've worked to a, a, to a point where um, people don't ask me weird stuff, right? Mm. And whatever I'm making, uh, weird stuff is like people, the uh, say subjects or projects that I would never take. Like, you know, a, a Heineken would never approach me, mm. right? Because the way- That's I a lot of money. <laughs> i'm just saying it's a, lot of, it's a lot of money that i don't need right yeah, so it's true. one of those um it's one of those things like i position myself that i do want to attract the right audience as much as i can yeah. and, and the right people i want to work with um and it's funny like i did this project for brother ali and um i got to meet him when he came to amsterdam and i was uh, we actually knew we actually had mutual friends so i was telling i was like man it's cool that we have mutual friends so we were able to connect and he said well that's not the reason i'm working with you hmm. he said the reason i'm working with you is because i've seen your work and i realized that this is the guy i need to work with so he said even if we didn't have mutual friends you were still the person i want to work with because hmm. the work that you're doing so it has the, the vibe that i'm looking for hmm. so in terms of like how now, I'm trying to make sure like what even whatever my work is, it just tries to like bring me closer to my creator. That's beautiful. And it's 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 easy to say that because I know that the work I used to do didn't really do that. And you know, uh, making a a poster for a like uh, at the time like reggaeton was a big thing. Right? It's like that's definitely not bringing people closer to the creator. And I'm definitely want to be. I don't want to be a part in that structure of inviting people to something that I don't. I don't partake in and I don't I wouldn't really tell anyone to go either so I was like there was a point where someone said oh this guy he this is custom he does these posters and these flyers for such and such and I was like mm. wait wait that's really not what I want to be known for like mm. if that's yeah. like what people know me for I need to make a move so that's where the name comes in and just making sure like okay now I need to make sure that I attract the right people that will help me reach reach my goals and in, in that process, I started like showing more of my interests, right? So, you know, where, this is where the Biggie, the Tupac and the Malcolm X as well, as well as an Alam Iqbal comes in, right? All these are like, you know, I'm going to sh show you like all these facets and, you know, you can't always put them into one picture, right? But I like, well, I'll just keep telling your story one picture at a time. And I make sure that I do write, like that's, that's what I love about Instagram is I, I do add something in into the caption that just gives you a bit more insight where, where I'm coming from. Um, so all these elements, like you now just kind of built, I guess, a, uh, my surrounding in a way that just keeps reminding me of, uh, of the goal I'm trying to reach. And mm. 
that it's a for, I'm fortunate to do so. And at the same time, I do believe that you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given each one of us something that we're kind of meant to do, right? Mm. It, whether you be like working in finance and you're like, or like a businessman, right? You have been given something that, like if that's something you excel in and you enjoy, there's a way for you to be like, like the best at it, like whatever, whatever that is. Um, for me, it's easy because it's so visual, right? Yeah. So you can see what I do. Um, you, you write pro- poetry. It's, it's easy for people to understand, but it, when people have a passion for something that's not necessarily creative for arts, yeah. I was like, well, there's still passion there and there's still something that you can excel in, right? And mm. that's the only thing that you're really being asked is like excel. And then, and of course, you know, within the boundaries of what, what, is, what is acceptable, um, so I'm fortunate that my passion is very visual right? mm. and it has, it has boundaries that allows me to do so much. I don't see the boundaries as very restricting, but that's where you know, the creative juices have to flow and you create something, you know, mm. something different that's out there. So yeah, I definitely get psyched when I do find so like the Jordan piece is like, yeah, I, I know no one's done that. Mm. Yeah. It was the same with the Malcolm X piece. I was like, I know no one's yeah. written Al Hajj Malik Shabazz like that. And mm. I feel like, you know, if someone deserves a tribute, that should be him. Mm, yeah. um, I was like, I've done the, I guess, the classical Quranic verses, and there's really nothing wrong with that. But I was like, mm. I feel that I need more than this at, at, at this moment in time. Mm. And that's where I think when you see that piece, and I think even at the, at the Muslim Vibe podcast, like the Muhammad Ali piece, this is in the background, or was at least in the podcast. Mm. I know, like, you wouldn't just walk past that. Yeah. Like, I know you're just going to, yeah. I'm just going to look at it and, you know, whatever it does. And, um, so I'm just just fortunate, man, that, that that my work is so visual and it's 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 a visual reminder. That's probably one of the best reminders you can get. Yeah. Well, I just want to take this moment to uh, appreciate you, Qasim. You know, I feel feel like you know I've been singing your praises <laughs> this whole episode, but <laughs> you know, I I feel like what you're doing um, is something that's really destined to grow and grow and grow and inspire so many people. You know, you spoke about how when you made the Jordan piece, for example, it, it might have meant something different to you than it did to me. Uh, and I feel like with every piece of artwork that you produce, it will inspire people uh, to, 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 you know, as you said, come closer eventually uh, to God in a very unique and original way. So, so thank you, man. You know, you, you, you come across as, as, as very uh, sincere and very God-fearing. And, uh, I try to be, man. I find Shall it really I? inspiring. <laughs> thank you so much. You know, sinners like me and Hasnay need you sometimes. Uh. I'd like you to come on the podcast and remind us <laughs> to get close to God. Um, as, a, <laughs> as, a, as, a, as a final question, um, what advice would you give to any young Muslims uh, who are listening to this podcast who want to get in uh, to calligraphy? You know, just you know, very like, practical advice uh, anyone young who wants to get into calligraphy what would you tell them i think one of the first things that i see uh when someone's starting calligraphy is like you're always emulating something that you see but i feel like people put their pen to paper too too quick like that you just mm. take the time and understand what's going on right i can see when someone writes something that they've not understood the the, the technicalities and like for me that was never boring but I understand it's like, oh, you just want to get right to it, which is okay. It's a way to learn. But it's like, you know what? When I give a workshop and I teach people how to write a certain letter, I also tell them what not to do, right? So when they write something down and I see, oh, these, these are the mistakes you're making. You're not holding the pen correctly. You're moving too quick. And this is not a single stroke. This should be like done in two parts. It's like, just take your time as well, right? And I guess my I guess my pet peeve with Instagram is that people share too easily what they're mm. <laughs> what they're working yeah. on, and yeah. sometimes I do get people asking me like, "What do you think of this?" And I'm like, "Well, I don't feel like you've taken your own time to look at your own work, mm. right?" Because what I'll be saying would probably not surprise you, because if you had taken the time, again, you know, when I started calligraphy, there was no YouTube really, right? So you you would have to I don't know, like even you'd have to read tutorials. Right? You, you, you used to have books <laughs> to know we how used to write, have books, right. To, to teach you Photoshop. So I've, I've, I've taught myself in a very different environment than now. Right. So now yeah. there, there was no Instagram, social media was, wasn't really a thing. Um, so I especially take time and analyze and just, it's, it's not a sexy word, but study, mm. study, practice and study and people, yeah. And when you share, 
do share, like, you know, if, I, if I've made a piece, which I know is like very unique to me, and someone copies that, let people know that you're inspired by someone else. Hmm. Right? I always used to like, if I would copy someone's styles, like this is directly inspired by this person because I do feel like I owe it to them that I'm making this right now. Um, so sometimes on Instagram, people tag me in like pictures like, yo, this is your design. I was like, well, no, this person's probably inspired. Uh, fair enough, no credit. That's okay, that's fine. Hmm. But I feel like, you know, you have to um, study more, take your time, and you know there's really no rush and you don't always have to make a career out of it man Mm. if it's just like a passion just go for it It doesn't you don't have to become the biggest calligraphy artist if if that's not something you want to do but you can still enjoy the art it can be therapeutic it can can give you so much more um but i guess especially young you're trying out so many things you don't really know what it is that you what you want to do but just take your time and you know emulate and I guess the most simple, find your own voice. I don't know, like, I know it took me quite some time to get comfortable. Like, I know what I want to do. It just took me some time to get comfortable with it. And um, the sooner you start realizing who you are and what you bring to the table, the the easier it will get uh, after that. So I feel like it's also my duty, like, if I do see an artist, or a younger artist to help them find whoever, whatever voice they, they have, whatever story they have. Because I know that when I found it, it was quite liberating. I was like, okay, I don't have to do this and that. I'm just going to focus on this. And that's that's quite liberating uh, to do so. So I don't know, that's quite a lot of advice, but you know, all of that <laughs> will help, uh, inshallah. Gossam, thank you so much. Really appreciate you, inshallah. Hope you thank can you get guys back on Thank you, man. Thank you. Inshallah, we'll see you guys soon. Assalamu alaikum.